OK, so we've passed one test, but can we think of another test that would uh, work out what's going on in the sun? Well, actually, yes. And in fact, we looked a little bit towards our information and detections here on Earth. We use this thing called seismology. We're able to detect activity, what's going on underneath the ground, and use it for useful measurements, as you would know, having studied geology. That's right. We get earthquakes moving through the Earth, and that allows us to work out what's below our feet, though we can't really go very deep ourselves. Could the same thing happen in the sun? Well, any object vibrates and any finite object will vibrate at particular particular ways. We talked about when we were doing spectroscopy yeah. that if you have a guitar string, it can vibrate once up and down, twice up and down, three oscillations yeah. up and down. Let's imagine you have something like a drum. Okay. Now, this is a bit more complicated than a string, but nonetheless, it has certain ways it can vibrate. These are called the modes of vibration. So even though it's kind of a more complex object, it still has discrete modes. So see, the basic mode is that the whole middle goes up yep. and down at the same time. Then you get the middle going out away from the edge. And then And three. then the middle and three. And then left side and right hand side in different ways. OK, so you can still get this substructure of modes, but it still follows a very specific mode and pattern. So there are particular modes that can vibrate yep. and particular frequencies that can vibrate. And when you hit a drum, you'll get these excited. Okay. When you get to three dimensions, there are more complicated modes called spherical harmonics. Um, and the simplest mode is where the whole object gets bigger and smaller at the same time. Yep. Then there's a one where it moves up or down or sideways to sideways. Yep. Or then there's where it gets taller and thinner and shorter and fatter. So it kind of squeezes or pushes. Yep. And then more complicated modes. And you can get modes up to this one in the sun. Um, so all objects, whether it be the Earth, the Sun, another star, another planet, they all vibrate in these modes. Yeah. What's happening is all the little storms on the Sun's surface are constantly shaking it, and the shaking, like someone blowing on a, down a woodwind or hitting a drum or something like that, will cause the Sun to vibrate in all these particular modes of vibration. And so these are all different modes that the Sun has to obey, essentially, that you can kind of tune into and look for. Because the interesting thing is, these modes basically consist of waves bouncing yep. back and forth through the inside of the sun. And as they bounce backwards and forwards, how much they move depends on the speed of sound deep within the sun. Okay. Which will in turn depend on the de density and temperature there. So you're really starting to be able to see the density structure as you go in. So, so far, all our model had was density at the surface, zero. Yep. And it had to get to enough in the middle to give us enough nuclear fusion and have the right total mass and had to have the right sort of slope. But that's not a very tight constraint. But this one, you can actually you find different modes of vibration will pass through different layers of the sun. Yep. So by looking at the strengths of one particular vibration as opposed to another, you can probe the density at different depths in the sun. And so this is really trying to fix that slope of our model. Was it exactly that fit or is it something really topsy-turvy? Did we get that angle of that slope right? Now to do this, one thing you could do would be to look at the surface of the sun and see different patches getting hotter and colder as waves come out. Okay. Can we do that? You can do that, and it has, can, has been done. Another technique is actually to look at motion of the surface of the sun, whether it wobbles inwards and outwards as a wave comes through it. All right. And to do this, we can use something called the Doppler effect. If you get something moving and sending out waves, the waves will be compressed in the direction of motion, spread out the other way. And so this changes the frequency of the wave? Or the wavelength, yes. So let's say you have a spectrum of, with an absorption line and an emission line of some object. Let's say white as the object if it's not moving. If it's moving towards you, all the waves are compressed, which puts them to shorter wavelengths. So you get this blue line. So because you're moving towards the bluer end of the spectrum. That's right. So it's called a blue shift. And if it's moving away from you, all the waves are spread out so they're at longer wavelengths. So it's moved towards the red end of the spectrum. So it's called a red shift. Now, I mean, this is obviously, you know, this is bread and butter for us. We know the, the waves, wavelengths move and we know the colors move. But this is kind of a little bit obtuse to remember, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, so there's a, something some of my students told me that the way they remember it. So the, if, if you like, think of Superman. Okay. He's, he's got blue at the front and red at the back. So if he's coming towards you, you see blue. If he's going away from you, you see red. So, so that's a mnemonic <laughs> to remember. Blue shift is moving towards you. Red shift is moving away. So Superman fans and uh, DC comic fans, Superman is the way to understand Doppler effect. That's right.